few months back, we were lucky enough to speak to one of the foremost cycling coaches in the world, Dr. Inigo San Milan, head of performance at UAE Team Emirates, the coach of Tade Pogacar, and also a leading light in the field of metabolomics as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado's medical school. Now, I loved talking to him. I think you loved it too. So I'm delighted to say that he is back, diving into zone two training a little bit more, answering some of your questions, as well as expanding more on some of the fundamental training zones that he prescribes. Now, we've purposely left the interview long so you don't miss any of the details, but let us know if you enjoy it. Hi, Inigo. Thank you so much for coming back. People absolutely loved hearing from you on the subject of Zone 2 training last time. You, you caused quite a stir. Well, thank you so much, Simon. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be invited uh, in such a popular channel. Thank you very much. Well, cool. Um, now, over the last couple of months, there's been a few common questions from, from GCM viewers about Zone 2 training. So I wondered if we could tackle them so that we're all on the same page and, uh, and everyone is, is doing the right thing with Zone 2 training. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I think one of the common ones, or most common ones, was the confusion around the name. And so how the Zone 2 that you prescribe kind of tallies up with with other zone twos that people are familiar with. So like the Andy Coggan FTP model of zones, often Garmin watches were mentioned, Apple watches as well. So everyone's got these kind of these zones. And so how, how many zones are there in your model? I've, I've only yeah. ever heard you talk about zone two. Yeah, that's a good question. So I started, you know, with this zone two, but almost 30 years ago, 27, 28 years ago. And uh, uh, the way I looked into the zones, um, I, I do a, I do more like uh, the bioenergetics uh, uh, from the, from a bioenergetics uh, point of view. So I, I start looking at what are the different bioenergetic systems that you want to stimulate with different trainings, and then how do you just um, uh, name those? You know, like based on you know training. So I just came up with zone one through zone six, right? So let's say for example. Um, the 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 way the, the way we recruit muscle fibers during exercise or basic sequential pattern, right? And 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 also the way we utilize different substrates for energy, right? So when you start going easy, you have the slow twitch muscle fibers, and they're like uh, twitching, right? They're contracting, and uh, um, they use uh, um, primarily fatty acids for energy. But you also use glucose. So we tend to overlook or oversimplify that we don't use glucose at low intensity when we, in fact we use glucose, right? But a predominant um, um, exercise is, is uh, fatty acids. Uh, they're being burned in mitochondria, right? But a little bit. So, zone, so that, that I call zone one, right? That's low exercise intensity. That is more like your recovery day in a way. Then as exercise intensity increases, those uh, slow twitch muscle fibers keep contracting and the intensity gets higher. Therefore, the ATP demand, right, to contract those muscles increases. And uh, you start utilizing more fatty acids and more glucose for energy systems, right? And that's where um, uh, you, you, you get to the maximal expression or stimulus of those slow twitch muscle fibers. It's in a way, I always say the similarity of the stick gears in a manual car, you're in first gear and you will see the RPMs going up, going up, going up and get, you get to the seven, 8,000 RPM. And then the car is telling you, hey, you need to shift. You shift to second gear, right? And so forth, the, the, the RPMs go up, you know, and, and then you have to shift to third gear, for example, right? So that's when you are, when you're uh, expressing or stimulating those uh, slow twitch muscle fibers to the highest, uh, that's kind of the crisp bit of zone two. Sorry to see that uh, this zone two corresponds to two major events, right? A first event is uh, uh, fat, fat oxidation. That's where you oxidize the most fat, which makes sense. It makes sense because fat during exercise can only be burned in skeletal muscle. I mean, in, in mitochondria of slow twitch muscle fibers. So that's when you express the highest fat utilization. And the second event is that you start utilizing more glucose. And that glucose, the, 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 the mandatory byproduct of glucose utilization is always lactate. So that's when you start having a first 
increase in lactate. But that, that's kind of I would define the zone too, right? And this is over the years of, of three decades of empirical work. Uh, this is where I see that you have the highest stimulation uh, at the um, uh, mitochondrial level. Uh, and why I see this? I see this because when when, ath when an athlete, and, and it doesn't matter if you're like a, 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 a professional cyclist or you're a marathon ru a runner or you're like a, an Olympic uh, rower, right? Which is like a six minutes maximum effort, really high intensity, right? So what, what I see is that when they stimulate that energy system, uh, which is the oxidative system, um, uh, they come back to the laboratory and the fat oxidation is much higher and lactic clearance capacity is much lower. So both um, fatty acids and lactate are mitochondrial substrates, right? Uh, the mitochondria utilizes a lot fatty acids and, and, and lactate. So if you increase a lot your fatty acids and increase your lactic cleanse capacity, that means that those, those mitochondria are better, right? The function than they were before. Then you have the zone three. In the zone three, what happens is like you already, the, 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 the slow twitch muscle fibers are fully expressed. That first gear, right? The 7,000, uh, 7, 7, 8,000 RPM, you have to shift to second gear. So that's when you start deploying more, recruiting more of the fast twitch muscle fibers. So that's another event that starts happening. So you start seeing that fat oxidation starts plummeting. Why? Because we're talking already about a faster twitch of those muscles, contraction. And uh, what happens there is like the ATP demand is faster. And although fatty acids can give you more ATP, right? Uh, it takes longer. So the muscles can't wait, right? So they need to start switching to another fuel. And that fuel is glucose. So that's when you're starting what's called a glycolytic system, right? Where uh, you start using glucose because uh, ATP is not fast. I mean, fatty acids are not fast enough to synthesize ATP. And that's where you start utilizing more of the glucose, which are, they, they give you less ATP, but much faster, right? So that's a transition air, um, a zone, zone three, where you start uh, decreasing your fatty acids and increasing your um, your glucose, right? And, and 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 therefore your lactate as well, right? And then you you will be like in that second gear, right? And, and then you start you, you you increase intensity and get to a point that that gear can cannot sustain much the intensity, right? And that that is uh, uh, or you're about to change to the next gear, and that will be your zone four. And the zone four is, is what we could call many names, you know, your lactate threshold, your FTP, uh, your maximal lactate steady state. This is something that I, I even, after all these years, I, I, I still question the whole lactate threshold because the lactate threshold, you know, I've, seen, I've, I've been seeing for a long time, is like a lactate threshold for what? For 10 minutes, for five minutes, uh, for 40 minutes, for a marathon. Right, uh, so we always, when, when we're in that situation, like whether it's a marathon or whether it's like a 15 minute effort, you know, this is where you know that if you go mm, 10 watts higher or five watts higher, you're gonna blow up, right? So you are that intensity, it is the maximal intensity sustained for your targeted effort whether it's like 15 minutes, or six minutes, or it's a, a marathon. So that's a very glycolytic zone where what happens is like the effort is so high that fat, fat, fat oxidation cannot occur, right? It's not fast enough. So the whole effort is glycolytic, right? It's a glucose, right? So you're, you're already in the third gear, right? And there's a, a, you're, you're deploying the turbo already. So the, the flux of glucose coming into the cell is massive, right? And 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 the two things happening is, is like, well, the main thing that happens is like that mass action effect of glucose coming in. Glucose has to be converted into pyruvate in the cell and pyruvate needs to enter mitochondria. But with such a high flux of glucose that pyruvate cannot be converted, uh, entering mitochondria correctly, so it's transformed or converted into lactate. So that's when you, you start pr producing a lot of lactate, right? And then that's when you start seeing that in the blood.
in very well athletes, trained athletes, uh, or in everybody, right? The, pre, the, the lactate produced from the fast twitch muscle fibers, uh, and this is what we have learned from the work of my friend of colleague and colleague uh, George Brooks from the University of Berkeley, that lactate uh, travels to the adjacent slow twitch muscle fibers to the mitochondria of those and it's oxidized as a fuel right it's a great fuel for the for the for the for the, for the cells and in fact most cells in the body if you if if if, if you sh show them or if you give them um, uh, glucose or lactate they're going to prefer lactate because lactate is a direct fuel that enters mitochondria uh that's it it's boom, one step and it's in there and glucose has to be broken down in multiple steps so that athlete who has a, like a world-class athlete or, or he's a very fit uh, has that cap capability, right? So therefore, they could continue transforming or, uh, uh, or converting lactate into energy in the adjacent muscle fiber. So lactate doesn't escape to the blood, right? So you don't see much of a change. But sooner or later, whether you're uh, a fatas like me, <laughs> or you are Tade Pogacar, sooner than later, you know, uh, you're going to uh, um, find a way, you know, where you cannot sustain that effort. So that's where lactate cannot be oxidized or burned in slow twitch muscle fibers in mitochondria and has no other pathway or route than, than go to the blood, right? So that's what you see in the blood. For me, it might be 250 watts. For world-class cyclists, it might be 400, <laughs> for 30, for 40, depends on your weight also, right? And then, uh, by then, if, if we have, if we continue with that uh, uh, recruitment pattern, right, we, 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 we already are at zone four, we need another gear. So we'll be in like seven, 8,000 RPM of a second gear, then you need to shift to the third gear. And that, that would be uh, uh, your um, uh, zone five and zone six. So the zone five is it's already and it's in my world. This is in my world again, huh? from a more like a biochemical, bioenergetic, especially um, uh, way, right, of thinking, training. Uh, so that that that's where like you would see, it's it's a, the equivalent to what people call maybe the VO two max, right? There are very high intensity efforts, two three minutes, full on four maybe maximum, and uh, uh, where um, um, even glucose is not fast enough to produce ATP, right? So you start utilizing a mixture of glucose and also ATP that is stored in the body, right? And, and then you don't require oxygen for that. So that's what's called the truly anaerobic uh, intensity. There's still, I mean, to me, it's hard to believe um, that after the whole aerobic threshold or anaerobic threshold has been debunked by my colleague George Brooks 30, 40 years ago, Still, people talk about anaerobic threshold or 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 or, 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 or aerobic threshold when we're talking about low intensities. Lactate can be produced under fully aerobic conditions, so uh, it's a matter of what I said earlier: mitochondrial function. So when we see when you see like a, someone is going like a 15, 20 minute efforts with high lactate levels, that person by no means I guarantee you is in an anaerobic state. There's not such an anaerobic threshold. Right. There is just is that the, the, those mitochondria cannot um, um, clear lactate fast enough, so they have to export it to the blood. But believe me, there's plenty of aerobic uh, uh, conditions there. Right, the only purely anaerobic conditions or transition is like when you're all almost full gas, and that's your VO2 max. That's what it is: maximum oxygen consumption. Past that point is anaerobic. Right, so that will be your zone five, and then lastly, the zone six is sprinting. Right, that's what, that's an intensity where the only available fuel uh, that you can use because it's so fast is your ATP stored in in, in the muscles. Uh, so, so that that and, and that's it. That would be the end of the story. That's what we're talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds. So those are like a in a nutshell that the six zones explained, if you will, in my from my world. Fantastic. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, so there's, there's six zones in the Sandman model. Then. Um, and crucially, I think you can't, you would say that you can't find them by working backwards from any kind of maximum wattage or heart rate or anything like that. Cause that's another kind of thing that people find difficult to understand is that you, you can't necessarily extrapolate your zones from one point. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I'm more of a, you know, like a, a 
bioenergetics and you know metabolics metabolism guy and uh, uh for me it's, it's difficult um i mean <clears throat> to find like a, okay find your ftp again we're talking about ftp for what for 10 minutes for 15 minutes for 40 minutes and then have a formula a percentage or ftp uh is i'm not saying that it is the same thing as 220 minus your age to establish your maximum heart rate which we know that is has never been proven proven and it doesn't work uh but um it, it's it's a it's a it's a surrogate or a proxy that mm, it, in in some cases might work in some other cases might not work um i rather use more like a, a physiological testing especially lactate testing right to to really see these probably i guess to work out zones beyond zone two harder for for your kind of normal person who maybe doesn't have access to the to the same kind of level of testing but one of the great things about zone two was that that whole conversation method as, as a way of finding it which seems like pretty pretty blooming accurate but one question that came up from that was that when you are riding and you're fatiguing and you're dehydrating and you get this sort of heart rate drift mm -hmm. if, if you know what your power is when fresh at zone two and you know what your heart rate typically is when you're fresh at zone two as as your those parameters start to drift should you go off power heart rate or perceived exertion feel in order to stay in zone two that's a great question and uh, a big conundrum, right? That a lot of people face, right? Should I go by heart rate? Should I go by power? And that that's where, like, going back to the coupling concept, that's when you decouple, right? And uh, so, sure, sometimes can be through, uh, due to uh, this is why it's so important also to look at listen to your heart, right? Because this could be a you're dehydrated. So you need to pay attention then. It's like, whoa, I'm dehydrated. It might be that cardiac drift that you would very well say. Or, or it simply could be that the metabolic stress, right, of that power output, right, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's unsustainable. And the heart rate means or might mean that, uh, yeah, you're under a, a higher metabolic stress because there, there's the assumption. And, and I presented this at the American College of Sports Conference, uh, uh, Sports Medicine Conference, like, I don't know, like in 2009, no, I don't know, 2001, I forgot, a long time ago, about this concept, 2001, yeah, about this concept that what's our what's. That was back in the days where people wanted to uh, teach heart rate all alone, right? And all of us who were working with heart rate, we were called old school, right? Uh, because our power up was, was the ultimate thing and everything was by power. But that's what I was seeing. I was seeing that people were getting overtrained, they were getting fatigued because they were just were told to train at this power output for their zone two or, or whatever of the day and, uh, um, and, 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 and and they didn't pay attention to the heart. So I, I, did, I did the study looking into the, the interactions you know between heart rate, oxygen consumption, lactate with power output to, to show that the concept of what's are what's is not necessarily true because going back to what what I said earlier, the ability to exercise depends on the ability to convert chemical or biochemical energy into mechanical energy. So we're looking at the mechanical energy, which is a power output, only that we're missing other information. So heart rate, for example, it's a, it's a, it's a true physiological parameter. Uh, heart rate and lactate, uh, they always go together. When there's a higher metabolic demand, there's a higher demand for oxygen consumption, Therefore, the oxygen needs to arrive to the tissues. And how does oxygen arrive to the tissues? By increasing um, uh, blood um, speed uh, through increased heart rate, right? Uh, so that's why it goes together, unless it's an artifact of dehydration, right? So the question is very good, uh, but you need to define or, or, or try to learn yourself, and is my heart rate getting higher because I'm dehydrated? Or is my heart rate getting higher because I cannot sustain this power output. And this is typical too, I, I see both, right? But, but when, when you are well hydrated and you keep attention to your hydration, you should not have a heart, a heart, a, um, a heart rate drift of more than four, five, six beats per minute, right? Uh, but if you have a heart rate of 10, 15 beats per minute and you're well hydrated, it probably means that 
those, let's say, 250 watts that you were prescribed, uh, maybe for the first two hours, were sustainable. But past that time, you're, you cannot sustain anymore. You're not adapted yet. So this is where maybe you were at zone two, but metabolically, you're not as efficient. And past that point of two hours, for example, you're already in zone three, right? Uh, so that, that's, that's quite typical. So it's a, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, we deal with that a lot. Okay, so definitely not power, and then a combination of heart rate and perceived exertion will get you, keep you where you need to be. And power, yeah. I like the, 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 try to stay that, 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 that coupling thing, right? When you see a decouple, right, between power and heart rate, you need to wonder why. How, how wide is the zone two window for people? And, and are you better to ride at the kind of the top of zone two? So with that rev limiter right on the edge of changing gear mm -hmm. or, or is there too much of a risk to tipping over that point? Yeah, that's a great question too. I like to, I like to push it to, to the top, right? I like to, to ride in the seven, 8,000 RPM versus the 5,000 RPM, right? So so sure, I mean, if you're riding the two, 3,000 RPM, right, with a stick gear model, or um, yeah, that's probably zone one already, right? So not much is stimulated at that intensity. Um, uh, when, when you do like, a, you know, like the low end of zone two might be five, 6,000 RPM, uh, in my humble opinion, is not such a high stimulus. It is when, when, when you're in that situation when, when the, that gear is, you know, you're in a 7,000 RPM and, and, and the car is asking you, shift, shift, shift. You say, no, you get stronger. Give me 1,000 RPM more. And that's what I find over the years that th that's, that's, that's where you push those, uh, uh, that mitochondrial function uh, to get better um, and more efficient. One thing that you said last time was um, that I think really um, surprised mm -hmm. some people was this idea that if you're doing a zone two ride and then you do a hard effort, it can then take your body up to 30 minutes to, to sort of recover and come back to that zone two. And so how hard is that effort got to be in order for you to, to lose that zone two? state that's a great question so um we know that uh when, when when you let's say you do like a zone four right and you can in the or zone even for some five so in, you're in a very glycolytic situation that is you use a lot of glucose and you engage the turbo right so that's going to have an effect of high lactate levels in the blood right so we know that uh high lactate levels um they bind to a receptor in uh in the uh fat cells adipocytes and uh, they, they, uh, that, that, that receptor inhibits lipolysis. And lipolysis is the breakdown of, uh, of, of fatty acids, right, uh, in, in those, in, in adipose tissue, right? Then the fatty acids have to travel through the blood, enter the muscles, it's a long trip, right? So you disrupt those bioenergetics, right? Um, and, and while you have high lactate levels, that's going to happen, right? Uh, then um, last year we published, my colleague and I, George Brooks, we published um, uh, a paper where we shown that lactate also at the, at the muscle level, uh, it decreases um, or, or inhibits uh, one transporter in mitochondria, that is CPT1 and especially CPT2, that is the door by which fatty acids enter mitochondria for energy purposes. So when you have high lactate levels in the blood, you have two metabolic events happen. Is number one is that you you decrease that the fatty acid breakdown, the lipolysis, and second, you inhibit or decrease that the entrance, the entry of those fatty acids in mitochondria. Right. So, how long will that last? It depends. Right. I might it might last 10, 15, 20 minutes. It all depends on what you do after that interval. Right. Whether are are you going to recover fully? And allow you know the body to 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 recycle all that lactate and recycle it, and therefore you're not going to have high lactate levels in blood. Uh, you, do you have a good mitochondrial function, and you can recycle lactate very well? But um, for some people, it might be five minutes. For others, it might be twenty minutes, right? So uh, if you have let's say two hours to train, and you do that high intensity, or or two bursts of intensity uh, in the first third of the training and then in the mid of the training. Yeah, you might inhibit that fat oxidation and you, you you might be outside the zone two for a while, even though the heart rate 
goes down, right? This is why eventually at, at some point uh, when we have uh, lactate sensors, we will train by lactate more than heart rate because in these situations you will see the heart rate will decrease to normal levels. But metabolically speaking, there's still a this 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 disruption of of all the bioenergetics is still because the body is trying to get into that recovery mode. So again, out of that hour and a half or two hour session, in this case, you, you might not utilize 30 minutes or so or 40. Okay? That's why I like yeah. to do that mostly towards the end, because you finish with your zone two, boom, and then you do that high intensity towards the end. You isolate different energy systems specifically, and they don't mix up. It's a, it's a cleaner way, if you will. Yeah. It sounds then, from what you're saying, like if you were to go that point at which you're kind of leaving zone two and, and, and meaning that you can't come back into it for a little while, you would notice it, you'll feel it. Because if you're talking about increasing levels of lactate and stuff, that sounds like quite a hard effort. So it's not it's not a case of I'm going to accelerate away from this stop sign at 500 watts for 10 no, seconds. No, exactly. Okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that's why I tell, look, this happens, right? Or you, you encounter a little hill and you go up a little bit, but don't dismount your bike and walk. <laughs> no, just do it, right? Well, thinking on that, I'm going to sneak a question in for me here, Inigo, if that's okay. So after we spoke last, um, I was I was training up for um, for a little objective of mine, the the Masters Cyclocross World Champs, and um, so I I throttled back on my high intensity. I I am your typical go out, or was your typical go out and smash yourself all the time, partly because I enjoyed it and partly because I felt like I was time crunched. And I must say, when I increased the proportion of Zone Two that I was doing not the total volume but um but the portion is into i felt really good but then actually when it came to it i feel like i kind of detrained from a from a competition perspective now is that because i've got a fairly long history of cycling and so my kind of my levels already quite high or was it just that i didn't give myself enough time to adapt to the zone two training even though the amount that i was able to fit in was relatively minimal that's a great point, and and this this is why it's it's. I was mentioning earlier that training zone four is critical too, right? And uh, maybe in your situation you didn't train in as much. That's the turbo, right? So, and we're, we're talking about cyclocross, right? In this case, which is one hour full out, right? Yeah. Very high effort where you're in the turbo, in the turbo, in the turbo. So if you haven't stimulated that. And this is what happens to a lot of people. They, okay, I'm going to do zone two, and they do a lot of zone two, but they don't do much with the zone four, right? So eventually that 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 energy system, that turbo, starts deteriorating, right? And you don't engage it as, as much. And you say, well, I, I can go the whole day, but ah, when I go this intensity, it's, it's, I, I don't have it. Yeah, and, and that's the, the turbo is not there. So that's why I was saying about uh it depends on your goals right uh if you're if if, if you want to if your goal is down the road and you i mean you have time to prepare and uh you're you're not looking into like full 100 percent cyclocross race uh maybe uh, you want to dedicate more time to zone two training uh and less time to zone four and as the competition gets closer and closer you start doing more of the zone four training but in the case of cyclocross you, you you need to train that as well at least two days a week right because you're going to need it and this is the, the glycolytic fibers you know that by energy ethics of gly glycolysis that you really need to deploy the turbo so that that happens quite a bit when people might get detrained in one energy system in, in this case glycolysis okay like, is it, yeah is I, I, I managed to do enough um anaerobic stuff to kind of to salvage it so it was it was all good in the end and um okay. and I, uh, I, felt, I felt really good off it which was fantastic i often come back to the theme of time crunch training because it's relevant to me and i think probably a lot of gcm viewers as well you've got yeah. jobs or school or family or whatever but theoretically if you had if you were full-time training so like a pro cyclist what would be the optimal amount of zone two to do is it a case of more is better or or is there a, sort of a limit at which you kind of you either get too fatigued or I heard someone say that you could be simply so well adapted to zone two that actually the, the metabolic demands, the, the calories that you burn are, are too great to be able to do all that much. Is that true? Well, I mean, you always could get 
either keep improving or maintaining, right? Uh, as we as we get old, especially, it's more difficult to maintain our physiology and metabolism. We start decaying. The same way we have wrinkles and, uh, you know, we start, you know, uh, deteriorating, right? So, you know, the same thing happens at the, at the metabolic and cellular level. So, but if you stimulate that, um, uh, you can maintain it. So let's say you're your typical person that only has 10 hours a week or eight hours a week, you know, or 12. Uh, that would be about four days a week, maybe, right? And I think that most people, right, um, uh, even if they're very busy, they can uh, afford or they should be able to afford four days a week, let's say an hour and a half, you know, two during the week and two on the weekends, you know. So let's say you can do four to five days a week and you have an hour and a half, you know. So I would, I would, and this is this is what I do. In fact, that's, that's me also, right? Uh, so I do uh, about three days where I, two of them, I focus on zone two. Uh, um, uh, a third day, I do zone two, but maybe towards the end, I do more like a zone four, because as we age also, our glycolytic capacity goes south. And then uh, a fourth day, it depends. I might get together with some friends and it would be your club ride, right? And you go all out, right? And you you have fun, right? And 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 by having fun like that and going all out and stopping and all out, you kind of stimulate a little bit of everything. Or because my my, my schedule is so erratic, you know, I just go for an, an extra because I might end up going by myself at 1 p.m. on a Saturday or something like that. I, what I can tell you uh, from my experience um, is that in the last 10 years, I haven't decreased my performance, right? And I'm, and I'm not getting any younger, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, to me, you know, it's it's rewarding to see like that um, I am not deteriorating metabolically speaking, right? Uh, over and and I'm um, I'm 52. I'm, <laughs> I just turned 52 the other day. Two, yesterday, in fact, no, oh, today. Happy birthday! Thank you. So, anyways, but uh, yeah, in, in 10 years, I, I look at my PRs and in 15 years, even included, you know, and and I'm even getting better at some PRs and ma- mostly it's for the equipment too. I think as well, speaking personally, and and again, just from things I've read from GCM viewers, I think people really enjoy this style of training. I think people enjoy having a reason to hold back and not feel like you should be flogging yourself all the time. And then also it means that you feel better for the days where you can let yourself off the leash. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's been great. And, um, so thank you again, Inigo so much for, for taking the time to explain it all to us and, and go through all these questions as well. So, uh, so yeah, thanks once again. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. My, my, my pleasure, as always. Thank you. What a total legend. Thank you again to Inigo Sam Milan for that. Please let us know if you've enjoyed it. Get involved in the comments section as well. If there's anything else in the field of training that you would like us to explore.